I'm so glad that you have decided to join us today for a new series that we're starting, Worship the Big Picture. Now, I don't know if you hear the word worship, what your definition of that might be. Maybe you think of worship as this gathering. Maybe you're thinking of worship as a song that we're singing. Maybe you think of of all kinds of ideas in your mind. And what we're going to be doing in this series is we're going to zoom out a little bit and we're going to look at the bigger picture and see what worship is truly all about. But before I jump into this today, I wanted to to share a little bit of um, where I grew up and some interesting things that that I saw there. There's some crazy people in South Africa, and specifically, um, there is a city that that I studied in called Pretoria. And Pretoria had a rugby team. Now rugby, if you take the amount of support that you guys have for hockey and baseball, and you combine that, you get the kind of support that Afrikaners, my culture, have for rugby, okay? So, so they're big on this. But we had this provincial team called the Blue Bulls. And those are a crazy bunch of people. Out of principle, I'd, I didn't support the Blue Bulls. Because every time the Blue Bulls would play, and their big stadium was just around the corner from our house, you would see people with pickup trucks with life-size fake bulls on the back. You would see all kinds of flags going up at their houses for the Blue Bulls. And if you go to that rugby match, it's just everyone is dressing blue. I'm like, I thought these two teams playing. Where's the rest? And then you're sitting there on your own supporting the other team. And when you just jump up, when the other team did something good, like everyone looks at you and you know, like this might be the last five seconds of my life, right? So that's some of the crazy people I grew up with. And it's a strange thing. It's only the Blue Bulls. Like the other rugby supporters are pretty normal. So then I moved to Canada and I thought like I'm leaving all of this craziness behind, right? But then I heard of a team called the Blue Jays. (laughs) Where's the Blue Jays? One on. The Blue Jays. And I'm like, it doesn't seem exactly as crazy, but they're still ditching the work for the Blue Jays games. And I'm like, I don't know if it has something to do with the color blue in a name, but it seems like the moment there's blue in a name, people go a little crazy, right, for their support for these teams. And then what I realized, it has nothing to do with even in the name. It has all to do with the color because there's another team that doesn't have blue in its name, but it's got blue in its colors, and their supporters are just as crazy, the Maple Leafs. I'm like, come on, look at those people. And here is the interesting thing. When we talk about worship, you might be like, Louis, I'm not a worshiping kind of person. But I want to tell you today that I believe no matter whether you consider yourself a worshiping kind of person or not, every single one of us do worship. Worship is not a Christian thing. In fact, when you go to the most ancient cultures, they always worshipped something. When you go to any person across the world, you will find that there's something in their life that they worship. And I think there is more worship going on in the stadiums of our world than often in the churches. When I read some of the reactions of people that worship God, how they would raise their hands, how they would um, shout, how they would be excited about what God is doing, how people would fall on the ground with their faces before God. And I see some of these people in stadiums, whether it's um, they are there for a musician, for a rock star, for a, whatever it might be, or a sports team. I think there is more worship going on often outside of the walls of the church than in the church. So whether you consider yourself a worshiping kind of person or not, I do believe that you are one. And why? Because I believe that God has created each and every single purpose to worship. There is a deep need inside of us to worship. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. Our first part in this series, Worship the Big Picture, is created to worship. Louis Giglio He's a pastor in Atlanta, and um, he wrote this book that I read a couple of years ago. I think it was called The Air I Breathe. And in the book, he, he defined worship as a follow. He, uh, he said, worship is your response to what you value most. In his most basic essence, it's got nothing to do with Christianity. It has nothing to do with these walls or with music. Worship is your response to what you value most. You see, each one of us value things. Each one of us have these idols in our lives that we often would not really acknowledge and say they're really there, but we have them. And it's an easy way to figure out what might be on that altar, what might be that idol in your life that you're actually worshiping by looking at the trail that your life 
is building. There is a trail in each and each of our lives. If you follow the money, if you follow the affection, if you follow the time, if you follow your energy, there is a trail that leads somewhere, and at the end of that trail, there is an altar, and at that altar, you are willing to sacrifice certain things. And at that altar, it could be your kids there, it could be your house, it could be a car, it could be your body, it could be more power or success, it could be knowledge. There's many things that could be at the end of that trail, but if we are willing to really sit and investigate where this trail in our life leads, we will find that there's an altar, and whatever is sitting on that altar, that's where our allegiance truly lies. So again, I believe each one of us are worshiping people, whether you call yourself a Christian or not. But I think there must be a deeper reason why we have this deep need inside of us to worship, to respond to something that we really value. And today we're going to be reading from Acts. But before I read from the book of Acts, I want to give you a bit of background of what's happening here. So at the beginning of the New Testament, we've got four books called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tells the story of the life of Jesus. But one of these writers, Luke, continued the sto- to write the story after Jesus ascended to heaven. And he then writes the story of the early church, the church that existed in a time when they still can remember the direct contact that they had with Jesus, right? But something interesting happens when we come to Acts 17, and that is that Paul, a guy that for, for a long time in his own life was searching for meaning, was searching for something more, and finally found Jesus, and then became one of the biggest church planters the world has ever seen, with this man, Paul, makes it to the city of Athens, Now, Athens is an incredible city even back then, right? It is the capital and the largest city of Greece. It has a recorded history spanning 3,400 years. It is named after Athena, quite ironically, and you will see why as well in a bit, the patron Greek mythological goddess. And what happens with Paul is he arrives in the city and he walks through the streets. If you read the story, he walks through these streets and everywhere we go, the Athenians were famous for building all of these temples to all kinds of gods. And, he, and, and if you just think about Greek mytho, myth, mythology, you will, you will remember some of those names, right? But he's seeing these temples, a temple for Athena, a temple for Zeus, a temple for this and that, that kind of God. And finally, he comes to this place where there's an altar that's built and on the altar, there is a a little inscription that says, to the unknown God. We have no idea who it is, but in case there's another one, like we build an altar for him. So Paul then starts preaching about Jesus, and he's basically captured. And in that process, he's taken to the Areopagus, and that was like this big rock that overlooked the city where the elders, where the wise people of the town could gather, and they would talk about all kinds of interesting facts about life, and they would debate with each other, but they would also make certain rulings when someone had to be judged. So this is where we're going to be reading from today. Paul arrives on this Areopagus, like in front of basically a bunch of judges, and he has to explain himself. So we'll be reading from Acts 17. If you've got a Bible here, you can open to Acts 17. It's going to be on the screen. If you don't have a Bible on your phone, you can download the Bible app. Or um, you're welcome to come and ask us at the info desk afterwards, and we'll give you a Bible for free. But let's read together Acts 17 from verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens... I see that in every way you are very religious, or you could say you are really worshipers. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is why this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history 
and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. That was not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. That's what we're going to read. It's interesting that when Paul is in, in Athens, like he doesn't find a lack of worship. There is temples everywhere. There's people bringing offerings to those temples. There's people doing all kinds of crazy stuff at those temples. He doesn't find a lack of worship. What he does find is an uncertainty. There is all of these places of worship, but still people are uncertain. Still they don't have certainty to the point where they even build a place of worship to a God that they have no idea who he could be just in case there is another one. So there's no lack of worship, but there is a lack of certainty. People were wondering if there was something more. And I believe in the day and age that we live in, in the 20th century, we are no different than the Athenians, where we are still in a place, whether you know Jesus or whether you don't know him, I believe we are still in a place where we constantly ask this question, is there something more? And this is what I want to talk to you about a little bit about this altar that the Athenians build. They have these altars to everything under the sun, but then they've got this one because they're wondering, what if there is a God that we have missed? It is interesting, in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, there was a huge move across the world, actually not that big, they thought they were big, but not not that big, of atheism, right? Like there is no God, there cannot, cannot be a God, we have to disprove the God. But then something happened, in the early 90s, a new generation was being born. So if you were born from about, what is 91, I think, or 90, uh, no, sorry, I'm lying. It's already from the 80s, 81 onwards to 96. That was the millennials. I'm a millennial as well. And it's interesting that all of the research said that millennials are the most spiritual generation to have ever lived, but the most non-religious. Then came Generation Z, everyone born after 97. Or from 97 onwards. And guess what the new research said? Listen, there is a new generation that's even more spiritual than millennials, and it is Gen Z, but they are even more non-religious than millennials. So what am I seeing when I'm just looking at the trends? I am seeing Athenians that says, we cannot accept that what we see here is all that there is. There must be something more. There must be a supernatural power out there. It cannot just be this. But we have no idea where to go or where to find this God. And we're building altars and we're worshiping stuff, but we cannot find this one. You see, and what we started doing is because our souls are craving for something and we're not sure what, we started to build altars and they started to fit our consumer-driven culture. I think one of the biggest altars we've built is on our mobile devices, right? On our cell phones. And people build these altars to YouTubers that's got millions of followers that will do anything for them at a flick of a thumb. There are TikTokers and Instagrammers and influencers. There's this whole, there's actually now an occupation. You can become an influencer just by posting some stuff on social media, even if it's just how to tie your shoe. I'm like, great influencers, right? But what I realize is we've built these altars because deep inside of us, there is a feeling of emptiness that we cannot get around. And deep inside of us, I think we know that there must be something more. There must be a God out there that can meet this deep need of me in my life. Why do people believe And I do think people believe that the answer lies outside of them, that it lies in the supernatural. One, the stats are saying it. But two, some of you are sitting here today, and some of you are not believers. Or some of you might still say, I'm spiritual, but I haven't found Jesus yet. Why do we think there might be something more? Why do we think the answer to this deep-seated emptiness, loneliness, brokenness, purposelessness in our lives, why do we believe that that lies with God, the answer to it all. And I want to read a second text to you today that joins in with this speech that Paul gave to to the Athenians 
also given by Paul to a different church, the church, um, the Colossian church. That was a, a community, a city in where we would find Turkey today. And he writes to them, but it's very similar words. And hear this in Colossians 1 verse 15 to 17. He says, the son, and that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. And hear this, all things have been created through him and for him. You see, there is an error in our thinking if we think that everything starts and ends with us. Because it doesn't. It started long before us. And it starts, the Bible says, in Jesus, and it is for Jesus. So I believe the reason that we, that we think there is something more out there than this physical world is because I believe God created us to worship him. We read that he created us for a specific purpose, and that is we're for him. We're supposed to be worshiping him. In, in verse 27, what does Paul say? What is the reason why God created us and, and gave people places to live and times to live? He says it's for this one reason, so that maybe they will start searching for him, and maybe they will find him. And maybe today it is your first day where you said, after some messages I've heard, after being here on Easter, after my friends invite me, whatever it might be, I am starting the searching process. But as a result of God making us for him, Louis Giglio says it so well. He says, as a result of that, there is this internal homing device rooted deep within your soul that longs for your maker. An internal Godward magnet pulling your whole being towards him. You might be here today, I have no idea why I'm even here. I have no idea why I believe there must be something more. I know why. It's because God created inside of you something that desperately longs for him, whether you know it or not. About 400 years after Christ, a man named, lived named Augustine. And Augustine was part of a group called the Manichaeans, and they were all about reason, rationality. If you can't reason it out, if, if you cannot figure it out with, with, your, um, with your brain, then it, it cannot be real. But Augustine finally came to faith. He met Jesus, and it changed his life so much that he became famous. He became a leader in, in the church. He's called the church father. But he wrote these words that, reso- that, that just kind of carries this thought further. And this is what he said. Thou, that is God, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts Our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. See, I believe you were created with a searching soul. That's what the Bible says. Verse 27, Paul is very clear. You were created with a soul that will search Jesus out, whether you know it or not. It's that magnet inside of you that's pulling you towards him. And Paul didn't just say this. He didn't just write this out of the blue. He experienced that. See, he was a Pharisee, so he grew up super religious. He knew big parts of the Old Testament by heart. He ticked up all the boxes. He did all of the religious rules. He stood when he was supposed to stand. He sat when he was supposed to sat. He read his, the law, the Old Testament, when he was supposed to read it. He did everything because deep inside of him, there was this desire to meet his maker. And finally, one day when he met Jesus, the Bible says this bright light shone on him. In front of other people, he got blind. God spoke to him, and that's when his life changed. And after that, everything is different. And I think Paul is writing this not just from a theological standpoint, but from this personal place where he was like, listen, I've been searching. I've been hoping for more. I've been feeling empty. I've been trying to tick off the boxes, and nothing has been working until I found Jesus. See, we have this natural deep desire to worship because God created us that way. And whether you believe it this morning or not, I want to tell you the question is not if you're a worshiper or not. We all worship full stop. Follow that trail in your life. Go and see yourself. Go and watch a replay of yourself at a Maple Leafs match. We all worship. 
The question is not if you worship, but who or what you worship. That's the only question on the table today. Even if you're sitting here and you're like, no, Louis, I'm an atheist, so I do not worship. You still worship stuff. There's still a trail in your life that leads to something that you value most. And that thing is sitting on an altar that you're willing to sacrifice for. You might be willing to sacrifice your family for your work. That's an idol. That's something you worship. You might be willing to sacrifice a lot of money for your morning Starbucks. That could be an idol. I don't know. I'm also a coffee drinker. I just make my own. <laughs> you can choose. You can choose today not to give God your worship. But you're still going to worship something. You cannot get away from that. But here's the sad part what happens when you choose to not give your worship to God. By making that decision, we decide that we will worship, but instead of worshiping the creator, we are worshiping the created. Instead of, of worshiping the one who deserves our worship, the one who's above it all, the one who created me, who has a plan for me, who loves me, who pursues me, instead of doing that, I am settling to worship something inferior that will not fill me, that will not change me, that will not bring that feeling that I've been craving to have of something more. But I know what you might be thinking if you're sitting here today and if you know Jesus, this might not be a question. Maybe it's still a question for you. But if you do not know Jesus, the question that you might have then is, okay, Louis, Paul himself said it's an invisible God. So how on earth am I supposed to worship a God that I cannot see? And Paul actually makes it quite easy in Colossians 1 for us because God knew that we would struggle. He made you. So he knows you. So he knew that you would struggle to find, G to find him. So what did he do? Colossians 1 verse 15 says it very simply. He sent Jesus, his son, which is the very image of God. So he's like, you don't have to search. You don't have to try to figure this out. God says, I want to be known. God is not hiding. God is not unknowable. Jesus left heaven and walked earth and died on a cross so that we can have a relationship with our Father in heaven. He's not hiding and he's not unknowable. And you're here today because deep inside of you, your soul longs for him. And he is not just this power like on Star Wars where you can move stuff but you don't really know what it is. It's not just this universal concept of being positive. It is a personal savior that cares about you, that says, I want you to know me. Jesus walked in plain sight so that anyone that's seeking God could find their way to him. So I believe God not only wants you to know him, but I believe that God wants you to know who you are as well. I believe the first thing he wants you to know this morning is that he has a name. Your creator, your maker, your savior has a name, and his name is Jesus. And that that desire for worship rooted deep inside of your heart was crafted by him and for him. And if you don't meet him, the problem is you will struggle with your own purpose. You will struggle knowing who you are because the significant part of what you were made to do is just missing from your life. He wants you to know that you're the object of his affection. You were created in his image. He loved you so much that his son died on a cross so that you don't have to die for your sin, your brokenness, your mistakes. He wants you to know that this God that you build an altar for, that you thought is an unknown God, he has a name. And he wants you to know that, that that desire in your soul is for you to worship him. See, when I read the story of the Athenians, I realize that they were right all along. With that altar that they built to an unknown God, they were right all along. There was another God. There was a true God. And his name was Jesus. 
And their lives would only be complete in Him. And Paul actually quotes there in, in the book of Acts one of their poets, their own poets. But he says, listen, when you find Jesus, something happens. Suddenly in Him, you start to live. In Him, you start to move. In Him, you start to be. So this is the way that if you reverse that, he says, without Jesus, you will never truly live. You will never truly move. You will never truly be. Something will be missing in your life. I want to tell you today, if you've been searching, if you've been wrestling with these big questions, with finding the truth, if you've been wrestling with doubt, and you're like, I know there's something more, but I've got all these questions and fears and doubt, you are not alone. You're not the first person to wrestle with that. Not only is there numerous people in this room that wrestle with those things the same way as you do, but the Athenians wrestled with it more than 2,000 years ago. Paul wrestled with it. Thomas, the man that followed Jesus, wrestled with it until he was able to touch the wounds on the hands of Jesus after he was resurrected. You are not alone. And being a Christian is not about jumping over a fence. It is not just arriving in this magical, perfect place. It is not just ticking off all the boxes and being religious. Being a Christian means that I'm choosing to start a journey with a God that loves me more than I can ever imagine. The one who was willing to give it all. The one who created me to worship him. So what can you do? If you're here today and you're like, Louis, I need, I, need to, I need to change my worship. I need to redirect it to the one that truly deserves it. Here is, I think, the most practical thing that you can do. Our attention aims our affection. Okay, that works in any relationship, in any kind of thing. If you really pay a lot of attention to your car, you're going to really love that car. Now it's like, you're not allowed to eat in it. Like, if there's a scratch, you polish it out. If you pay a lot of attention to your spouse or to your children, you're really going to love them. Your affection for them will grow. If you ignore all of those things, your affection would shrink back. Attention aims our affection. So if our worship arrows, think of a bow and arrow, right? Where you're shooting at a target. If our worship arrows are not going to hit this target of Jesus, our affection for him is not going to grow. So I want to encourage you today to make a decision and to say in the next couple of weeks, even if it's just showing up here for every Sunday, these four weeks to this series, I want to encourage you to say, I'm going to choose for just the next four weeks to aim my attention at Jesus. And I can almost assure you, your affection for him will grow as well. And if you are after that four weeks, you're like, man, this still doesn't work for me. Come on, you missed a a couple of, of weeks. No biggie, right? But I believe without Jesus, you will never find what you're looking for. Let me warn you with this before I close. You are a worshiper. That's what we were made to do, no matter what. And something in this life will captivate your heart and your mind. And whatever captivates your heart and your mind, that will drive your life. It will aim your steps and it will determine your destiny. Because we become at the end of the day what we worship. We become like what we worship. So be careful because not everything that you worship is worth, is worthy of your affection. So will your worship be spent on what matters most? I believe when you find Jesus, I believe when you say, Jesus, like, I, I want to find something more. I'm tired of searching. If you find Jesus, if you find that he's the one who's truly worthy of your worship, so much will change. That chase of something more, the issues of never having enough, no matter how much stuff you have. That feeling of emptiness, the feeling of living without a purpose, the feeling of loneliness, that... That will change because Paul says, in him, we live, we move, and we be. In him, life makes sense. 
So if you're willing to journey with us, I want to I tell you now already, and I want to warn you already, that grace is not a religious box you can tick off this church. This church is a movement. It is a worship movement. Where it's not about ticking off boxes or doing all the right things or just showing up or looking pretty or hiding all of your imperfections and your doubts and your questions. Grace is a worship movement where we choose to put our attention and our affection, to give it to the one that truly deserves it. Let's pray. Jesus, there's so many things in this life that distract us. Things that just draw in our attention. Things that steal our attention. And that finally become these idols in our life. I want to pray today for every person sitting here. Every person that's searching, every person that's feeling that emptiness, every person that feels there must be something out there that's more than what I can see. And I pray, Jesus, that they would find you. And I pray for all of us that our life's trail would lead to you. That our attention would be aimed so much on you. That our affection would grow so much. That it would be visible to the world around us. That everything of who we are would be so different. That people would have no option but to see Jesus in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.